getting cold outside, but it's certainly heating up in the next generation war. Everyone's throwing their hardware out, and now it's AMD's turn with standing on the precipice of their Navi 21 and 22 launch. Now, earlier today, I did see an article um, about some information I've been chatting with other people about. Not leaking, I'm not into all that stuff, so don't get me as a leaker or anything like that rubbish, but I've seen and heard some of these figures before, so as I did my video a couple of weeks back in terms of what I expected from AMD, and obviously these leaks point to the fact that that was very true. There's also the point which I didn't discuss in the last video, but now it seems to be common knowledge around the Infinity Cache. Now before I go any further, there's no secret source here where I'm getting this information from, and no leaks are spraying everywhere giving me this information. None of that is true. This is just cold, hard analysis of where RDNA 1 was from their white paper, which I've put the link in below, you can read some of this. And then understanding how hardware works and technology over the years, and understanding how the Infinity Cache will most likely work. The first thing is, the rumor I've heard about the 128 megabytes of L2, that's probably where it's gonna be, L2 is gonna be increased in size. Maybe uh, an increase in L1 as well, but I, that seems crazy to me. If they do that, then that's a huge, that really makes the chip massive because that has an impact on the amount of space you've got left on the die. So 128 megabytes of L2, bearing in mind you're going from a current L2 of four megabytes um, in the RDNA 1 cards, that's a massive increase in terms of um, improving the performance. So I don't suspect it'll be that big, even in the 80 core one, but I could be wrong. Like I said, there's no special secret source here. I'm not telling you something that I know from behind closed doors. So I would imagine it's going to go upwards. It's probably going to hit around 8 megabytes to 16 megabytes between the 40 and 80 core units. That makes more sense to me. Huge increase in terms of L2 with a the 16-way connection, so I'm not going to get into all the technicalities. I'm going to keep it nice and simple, a nice high level. The first thing is it's probably to do with the fact that the equivalent of 128 megabytes is the performance level of what they're doing with Infinity Cache, not that it is 128 megabytes of L2. The second is, what is Infinity Cache? Effectively, when you talk about GPUs, CPUs, anything to do with main memory, nothing operates in main memory. Go back to my... Um, PS4 Pro video when I talked about registers and how CPUs and GPUs work and how it's all like the hands and the, the example I gave there which you can see on screen is obviously comical but it works so that description is true of everything so GPUs are exactly the same so you've got your CUs your compute units that are processing data so let's talk about them as cores I know they're not cores everyone gets carried away but for this terminology it makes sense you've got your main memory and then from your main memory, you go down to your L2. Now your L2 handles all the connection strings back to main memory. So that's your service request. It's, it's two way and your L2 caches then speak to your L1 caches, which is your single point of contact to pull that data back and forth. This is an RDNA one. So they, they were, they're brand new. They've been introduced in terms of the RDNA cards. And then they speak to the L0. So the data instruction cache, all the agents, which then by proxy go and speak to the compute units and that's the chain of events that's how the whole process flows now the l1 cache actually has individual privatized banks of data per individual compute units so per, per core has its own little allocation of data and as you can see here all of those banks all of those lines is a registry address it's information from an address space that a data is stored that it can work on it can only work on data there system ram might as well be on another planet the speed difference is huge but the problem is, as you can see, with the colored lines representing data, where it's the same color, it's the same data. You duplicate data a lot in these L1 private caches, which means you don't use the space well, you overutilize it, and if you don't have data in there that you need, you get a cache miss. Now, a cache miss is where you go to do something, it's not there, and that affects performance massively, because then you've got to go to L2 to get it. If it's not an L2, you've got to go to system RAM, and then that cycle repeats. And the further out you have to go from where you start, the slower it is. So the cycle time, sometimes between one to three cycles per clock for L1, somewhere around 10 to 20 for L2, and somewhere in the hundreds for system RAM. So magnitude slower, magnitude more expensive. So when you shrink your GP, your CPU down or your GPU down on your die, the smaller you go down the manufacturing fabrication, so seven nanometer, the more difficult it is to get long electricity, long traces, long runs of data. So you have to be very careful. So the more you minimize that, obviously the narrower you make the bandwidth and therefore 256 bit, it reduces pressure, it reduces cost, it reduces power usage, and that's all a good thing. So there's a definite power advantage here and potentially a cost advantage by using caches more often than system RAM and lowering the bus width so for main memory the speed is 448 gigabytes per second that's its maximum bandwidth it can push through 
the caches run at terabytes per second. So if you can improve the performance and work more often in your cache and don't get misses, you get cache hits. Now the structure now is usually around 95, 97% of cache hits. So that sounds great. You think, well, 3%, what's that going to do? But I've just explained, if you miss 1%, it doesn't cost you 1%. It costs you the time it takes to go to the next refresh cycle, how many cycles it takes to get that data in. So one miss can be 10 times slower than being at L1. And then if you go to system run, it can be hundreds of cycles slower. And then you just sit and doing nothing. You're idle. And this is when you stall. This massively affects CPUs and it massively affects GPUs. There are lots of workloads that are, you hide that latency, you hide the time so it doesn't impact you as much. But by no means is it everything. So if you can improve it by 1, 2, 3% and get to 99% of hit rates, that massively improves your performance. But more importantly, it improves the throughput and the utilization of the GPU. You're not stalling as often, you're using the space better. And you're traveling back and forth to other caches and system RAM much less. Therefore, you're reducing your power threshold as well. Your TDP comes down. And all of this adds up. As does the ability to improve the throughput and speed of these if you improve the clock rate of the chip. Therefore, all your caches all go faster and they're not affected by going back and forth to memory. Sound familiar? So the plan of the Infinity Cache, allegedly, um, and this, this sounds similar to another option that we heard mentioned at the PS5, so just bear that in mind, is you actually have these shared across the compute unit. So the L1 cache becomes a shared unit and it no longer duplicates data. It takes the fixed array, fits it into RAM, and then everything has a clean split in each of the clusters. So whenever you need data, if it's in one of the clusters that's in that, that shared array, your other compute unit can use it and pull it in. It can then be gently evicted when it's out of date and it's stale and then updated from L2 ahead of time by pre-empting, just like branch prediction on CPUs, which you know are exceptional now in terms of assuming what data is going to be needed and when, it can pre-populate that data and maximize it. What this means is you spend less time going back and forth to system RAM and therefore you spend more time working on data that's in your caches and therefore you do not need a huge bandwidth. And this is explained by the fact that the new leak obviously points to the fact that every card is going to have a no bigger than 256-bit cache uh, bus. So if you are operating more often in here and therefore you're gently cycling data ahead of time, just like the SSD construction, so you're streamlining that throughput so all the data you need is at hand more often and therefore it minimizes the amount of bandwidth you need. On top of this, if you increase those caches, you know, just by... 50% or 100%, um, that's a massive increase in the amount of data you can get into these caches, both your L2 and your L1, just improves proficiency and performance. Now, obviously, there's that combination there of private and shared caches. There's still going to be areas where you need the two. So it's effectively managing that in terms of the white paper. You can read it below on what their proposals are. So this is most likely what they're doing. Now, in addition to this, you can see the fact that this is a synergy that they've followed over through their Zen. So the Zen has been a the, the, the hallmark of AMD. They've pushed through with the Zen and the Ryzen CPUs. And Zen 3 is culminated now in that unification of the L3 cache to improve performance. Most of the IPC and performance improvements from that particular chip have come from that unified L3 cache. So you can see where their mind process works, and that works for everything. Caches are important for every single piece of hardware. So CPU, GPU benefit from it massively, and they've done exactly the same thing they've just announced. So it makes sense that they are sharing those synergies and improving their Radeon card GPUs from their Ryzen path, and it, it's worked out pretty well so far for their CPU team. So I think they're on the right track. But obviously, a lot of this information needs to be confirmed specifically. So like I say, this is just me hypothesizing based on information available. I'm not saying this is fact, so just don't go quoting that this is what it's going to do, but we can come back and see how close I am in a week or so. So what does this mean then in terms of the GPU and the throughput of the GPU? Well, obviously, it means that that bandwidth doesn't mean what you think it means. You look at it and think, well, that's bad. It's going to struggle at 4K. It's going to be bandwidth and fill rate limited. But obviously, these issues get rid of that. So there's the on-paper potential to take a 512 gigabyte bandwidth per second and uh, if you're around 26 percent better that's another 133 gigabytes per second speed therefore you're getting 645 gigabytes of bandwidth from that 256 bus gpu now that isn't how it works obviously what it means is it it's somewhere around 20 
30, 40, 50% improvement in terms of throughput. So it's about maximizing the potential of the hardware, not improving its throughput, not, not you know, punching up its weight and all that kind of stuff. As I've said before, it's about working smart, not hard. And this is a classic example of working smart, not hard. And this is exactly what consoles do. That's why I think there's a synergy here between working with Sony and what Mark Cerny was alluding to in terms of that upcoming AMD card that may use some synergy. So I think that's where we should be expecting them. Let's just wait and see what comes out. I'm not saying here that some secret information, but let's just wait and see. What we can see is what AMD showed themselves. Now, they showed performance levels for a 6000 series card. Uh, they showed some stats and everyone's jumped on the bandwagon and said that this is not great and there's certain 3080 cards, but they didn't say average, did they? They just said these frame rates and she lisa sue specifically said a 60 frames per second on borderlands 3 what if those are the lows and not the average at 61 frames per second borderlands 3 is already at the same level as the 3080 from tests um gears 5 is within 10 percent and modern warfare is within two percent so if that's average that's great if it's lows it's even worse for nvidia and looking on paper, like I say, with these uh, these improvements, the 6800 XT could and will compete with the 3080. It's got more RAM, for one. It's potentially got better utilization because of the cache, uh, infinity cache. And then the percentage difference between that and the 6900 XT is going to be around 15 20%. So it's going to be close to the 3090. There are thereabouts, 5% back and forth. So I expect that these will compete with nvidia they might not beat them every time but they'll beat them on games i think that's that's clear as day and i think what we saw here was the 6800 xt i don't think this is the 6900 xt in fact i'm almost certain of it and these are early drivers drivers can improve you know anywhere between five ten percent i've just covered my api discussion around how software can affect hardware so use that out so this is early days these will improve from the figures here but i think and AMD are playing games here. I think they're they're just baiting a little bit. Und over promise and under deliver is the terrible thing to do. Nvidia have done that twice now. Um, I think AMD have learned from their lessons before. They've done it multiple times as well. So this time they are under promising and looking to over deliver. And that's great for us. So I'm really intrigued. So my expectations of the last video haven't changed. I still think it will sit there or thereabouts. The smaller Navi 22, the, the 40 unit, will probably lose more often than not to the 3070, but not in every game, and it will be there or thereabouts, but I think the 6700 will be significantly better consistently, and I think everything we've talked about in terms of the hardware construction is all about consistency, can prove, improving that consistency, lowering the 1% lows, therefore improving your average and your low point, and therefore you get better performance overall. The fill rate's better on these cards, and also the fact that it uses the TMUs to help in that uh, BVH traversal. I don't think they're going to beat NVIDIA in terms of ray tracing. Of course they're not. But I think there's a chance here they will be closer than people think. And I think that's what is exciting. They've got high level of TMUs there and they're utilizing that well in terms of the caches I've just mentioned. That will also improve that performance rate because it's all done internally within the caches and the TMU units. And therefore you get better performance out of it. So I suspect there might be you know, somewhere around 70-80% of the level of performance uh, in RT. They haven't got DLSS and that's, that's another sign that... Um, NVIDIA are pushing that harder and harder so to see what that comes out in there's obviously options the CAS solution the Fidelity FX upscaling and that these are getting better from AMD you can see example on screen from their own hardware in terms of taking a 720p image and improving the quality by using that upsampling machine learning will improve if they've done additional altercations to the registry addresses to the caches to push that through on the wave front so that rather than just running 64 in the back compact mode which it does for GCN it can run 32 232s 16, 8, 4, all of those options therefore means that machine learning will run even faster when you can get more through the system and use the caches. So all of these things sound quite exciting in terms of letting engineers get their foot in the door. And I think AMD should be given a big round of applause. They're not um, anywhere near the behemoths of Intel and, and NVIDIA. They're a big company, but they're not at those levels. And yet they're competing at those levels. Not only are they competing, they've given Intel more than a bloody nose. They've taken away their lunch from the server space, streaming data centers. I know that firsthand. And they're certainly completely dominating the desktop market, certainly in mind share, if not market share overall. But that's certainly creeping up. And they're about to repeat that, I believe, in this, this war coming up with NVIDIA. NVIDIA look a little lost. Uh, I think they're going to come back with a new 7 nanometer card next year. I think that's one of the things they're holding on with additional RAM and additional performance and improve all of that and get back in the game. But right now, I can absolutely see AMD coming out and being the top 
manufacturer for both CPUs and GPUs going into the Christmas period of 2020. And that is something to be excited about. No matter which side of the fence you sit, competition is the best for us all. And that's what this looks like. This looks like real stiff competition. We saw Zen, it was great, but Zen 2 was, it was absolutely amazing. And Zen 3 has now raised the game again. I do believe that RDNA 2 is the Zen 2 moment for the GPU space. And I will be here firsthand to test, analyze, and look at it as much as I can. I reach out to as many people as I possibly can. And as you know, I'm completely self-funded and independent. So as much help as I can get from you guys to raise my numbers, improves my reach, and therefore I get more contact and more ability to get hold of these pieces of hardware, the sooner the better, and give you that information. Anyway, I hope you guys and girls enjoyed this. Leave your thoughts and feedback below as always, and I'll catch you on the next one. But I hope you're as excited as we are about what Ryzen 5000 series and Radeon 6000 series can do together for your next generation PC.